Ah, uh, uh, don't touch that dial. Randy's Old Time Radio Show presents... Catch Scarlet Queen. Position 123 degrees 8 minutes west, 37 degrees 31 minutes north. Gyro compass course 237. Wind fresh, sky fair. Remarks. Cleared port of San Francisco at 2.30 p.m. Sailing delayed 19 hours due to death of first officer. Cause of death, murder. I stood there on the pier that evening, the ache in my frame reminding me that a long, hard day of loading stores was behind me, and looked out over the bay. It wasn't a night for stargazing or anything, just typically San Francisco, damp and gray, the kind most people trade off early for steam heat and drinks and short glasses. But for me, it was good. The Scarlet Queen nudged her fenders against the dock right below me. She looked clean and young in her new white paint with her... Shining bright work, picking up the pier lights like costume jewelry and a neon. She was beautiful, and she was mine. All 78 feet of her. She rose and fell just a little, even in the quiet harbor water, delicately, lifting her figurehead out of the shadows now and then to give her a glance at the dock. The Scarlet Queen, a fresh young body, looking forward from just under the bowsprit. Bold, teasing, dressed in only a crown and painted scarlet. But that particular gray San Francisco night wasn't cut out for a romance between man and lacquered wood. I didn't hear him as he walked up behind me, but it didn't take me long to pick up the odor of a jail cell after he opened his mouth. You Philip Carney? Yeah, that's right. I'm Kessel, homicide. You know a man named David R. Malone? Yeah, he's my chief mate. Who'd he kill? That's not what I'm interested in. I want to know who killed him. Come on, you got a date at headquarters. Wait a minute, wait a minute. This is a little sudden and a full stomach. What happened to him? How was he killed? The books are going to call it murder by a person or persons unknown. Homicide wants to know you better. And so begins the voyage of the Scarlet Queen with Phil Carney, master of the proudest ship to plow the seas bound for uncharted adventure. Every week, a complete entry in the log. And every week, a league further in the strange voyage of the Scarlet Queen. Your last name, first and middle initial. Carney Philip M. Age? 29. Height? Six, two and a half. Weight? 207. Eyes blue, hair brown. Scars or other identifying marks? Yeah, a tattoo. A three-strand Turk's head in my right bicep. A what? A three-strand Turk's head. It's a knot. You know, or does somebody else tie your shoelaces? A knot. Kessel, I'm getting awful sick of this. Shut up and answer the question. Address? The schooner Scarlet Queen. Street number? Street number? Well, how on the... Pier 12, berth 2, Embarcadero. Not permanent. That'll be enough for now, O'Brien. That might be a pretty permanent address at that, Connie. Not with me paying the rent. My lease is up day after tomorrow. Yeah, we'll take care of that. How long had you known Malone? Since, uh, oh, about five days. Not about, Connie. How long? Five days. I signed him on five days ago. When did you see him last? Exactly. Between 12.30 and 1 this afternoon, I saw his stern end going around the warehouse at Pier 12. He turned to the right. Exactly. He went to room 218, the Crown Hotel on Columbus Avenue in the North Beach section. Why? Because he's human, I suppose. They build hotels for people to go into. He didn't look human when we found him. Look, Kessel, I don't know anything about it. I'm sorry Malone's dead. He was a nice guy. But that's all I can give you. I saw him between 12.30 and 1. The rest of the day, I spent loading stores. If you want proof, I've got four seamen who worked with me all day. 
That'll carry me to the time you tap me on the shoulder. What do you want, a halo? <laughs> yeah, don't get sore, Connie. Yeah, have a cigarette. No, thanks. All I want's a cab back to the Embarcadero on you. Sure, sure. We'll take care of that. Just a couple of more questions. <laughs> that patience act fits you about like a bare midriff evening, evening gun. <laughs> thanks, Connie. Might not last. Uh, what information could Malone have learned on your Scarlet Queen that somebody would go to a lot of trouble to get him out of? What are you talking about, Kessel? Malone was tortured for a good long time. And then somebody slipped or lost their temper. He didn't know anything. He didn't know why $50,000 was deposited in your name last year? I don't know what you're talking about. Hey, Barrett, bring Funston in. The name Funston rang just a faint bell for me, but... I recognized the little guy they brought in, all right. If there was anybody you knew about my banking business, he did. He worked there in the assistant cashier's office. Down there, he was just another face looking at you through rimless glasses. But here, he looked like trouble. Mr. Funston, is this the man you say received that $50,000 letter of credit? I'm sorry, Mr. Carney, but the police, you know. Yes, sir, he's the man. Remind me to bank someplace else next time. That's all, Mr. Funston, thank you. I, I hope you understand, Mr. Carney. I had to answer the question. Goodbye, Funston. It's been grand. You guys have got long noses, haven't you? Uh-huh. When things smell as rotten as this. It was deposited in the San Francisco bank while you were in China with the Marines. Where are you getting this, Kessel? It was sent over as a letter of credit from a firm in Shanghai called Kang and Son. Most of it went to a local shipyard where your Scarlet Queen was built. To a flock of coast companies for your cargo. 50,000 mystery dollars, Connie. And a voyage to nowhere. I won it in a craft game, and my articles say Honolulu. Honolulu, with enough stores aboard for a two year cruise? What do you think you're kidding, Connie? Why don't you talk? Why don't you get tired? You're pumping a lot of bilge flush. You're bluffing your heart out, and you know it. All right, Connie. You can go. But uh, we'll be hearing from you. Sure. Sure, I'll send you a postcard from Honolulu. Be a Christmas card by the time you get there. I'll take that cab now, huh? With 50000 in mystery money, you can pay for it. Now get out of here. I would have traded places with any engine room hand on any Great Lakes ore ship after I left Kessel, and I hate fresh water almost as much as I hate engine rooms. Kang had warned me when I signed with him in Shanghai. The opposition, he called him. An octopus with a body in an office building in Hong Kong, a brain called Felix Van Gort, and the tentacles groping across the world for the prize Kang was sending me after. A $10 million prize somewhere in the South Pacific, but only Kang knew where, and only Van Gort and Kang knew what it was. I didn't know who the San Francisco tentacle was, but he'd warned me, and I'd fed Malone to it. I knew he'd been tortured for something even I didn't know. The true destination of the Scarlet Queen. I locked my cabin door, closed the ports, and poured a couple of stiff drinks. I checked my naval coat on the disposition of the monies and effects of deceased seamen and got Malone's stuff together. In a pocket of one of his coats, I found a match folder from the Gorgonia, a bar advertising pre-war whiskey and continuous entertainment. On the inside was a name, Helen, and the number 218. So I kept it. By 11 the next morning, Malone was written off my books and my new chief mate was aboard an old salt by the name of Pritchard. By 11.15, Kessel's crack about that Christmas card made sense because the Coast Guard handed me a piece of paper saying my port clearance had been revoked indefinitely. And at 11.30, I was in my cabin cleaning a 45 automatic that I'd gotten out of the habit of wearing. And that's when I met Gallagher. Big Red Gallagher. Hello, Skipper. Who the devil are you and how'd you get aboard? I wanted to talk to you. I'm Red Gallagher. Where's my gangway watch? He's got orders. Nobody aboard. He tried, Skipper. Don't blame him, but you know how it is. I wanted to talk to you. He didn't have to explain. He held up a hand about the size of a fielder's glove and rubbed the knuckles as if they were bruised. He didn't have to say any more. He was about my size, wearing a shapeless, stained white duck officer's cap, faded dungarees, and a jumper with the sleeves rolled up. His face was heavy-featured, but not flat. His eyes, gray and set off by crow's feet wrinkles from squinting into the sun. And they were laughing at me. But no harm done, Skipper. He isn't hurt bad. 
Maybe he wasn't big enough to put you over the side, huh? Now, wait a minute, Skipper. Say it easy. We just bust a lot of furniture and lose a lot of skin that way. Don't be so jumpy. All right, unload in a hurry and get out of here, then. What do you want? I hear you're looking for a new chief mate, and I want to sign on. You're about two hours too late. What? My new mate signed on. And listen, if anybody told you the way to get a berth is to start knocking the crew around, they gave you the wrong idea. I wouldn't get into a dory with you. Oh, wait a minute, Skipper. I was made for this trip. I've been with Sail all my life, and I traded three years out of Sydney. I know that's South Pacific. How do you know where I'm going? <laughs> if that scarlet beauty under your bowsprit hadn't whispered to me, I could have checked your bills of lading and found glass jewelry, knives, and general Pacific trading cargo. You're too nosy for me, Gallagher. That's because I'm interested. Give me the bread, Skipper. What do you say? I say get your sea boots off this ship. I'm manned and loaded and ready to shove as soon as I get clearance. When do you think that'll be, Skipper? What do you mean by that? There you go, getting jumpy again. That was a civil question. I just wanted to know how long, that's all. It'll be as quick as I can make it. Yeah, I guess I can't blame you for that. But maybe it'll be long enough for me to try again. You need me on this ship, Skipper. I've lived a long time without you, Gallagher. Keep your eye on the newspaper shipping column. That's as close as you'll come to my sailing. I went to work on the 45 again, and at about 9, I got ready to follow the match folder. The Gorgonia was a typical non-tourist North Beach bar. Good, healthy fisherman up from Fisherman's Wharf. Three women at the bar, and one sitting in an electric organ up on a platform. None of them had uh, Helen printed on their backs, but the only one whose name anybody would bother writing down was the gal making with the music. Honey-colored hair with a gardenia over the left ear. White shoulders pushing out of a whiter gown. A face full of confidence in the rest of her. And no wonder. After I finished my drink, I walked back toward her. Say, uh, excuse me, but uh, would your name be Helen? Well, that's a novel approach, isn't it? Should I go back and try it over with Irene or Penelope? What's the difference? It'd end the same way. Can I play something for you? Oh, this one suits me. If I can talk to you through it. Can't for the life of me see what we'd have to talk about. Uh, maybe some other time we can get around to that. But I ran into an old mate of mine yesterday. He mentioned this place and you, and now I'd like to locate him. His name is Dave Malone. You know him? Malone? You sure he said he knew me? Yeah. Yeah, I thought so, but... <laughs> Maybe he was just hoping, huh? Afraid that must have been it. Because I don't know any Dave Malone. Yeah, well, it was one of those things he mentioned your name, so I thought I'd give it a try. But I'll, uh, I'll browse around. And maybe I'll come back on my own sometime. I hope you do. I'll be here. Yeah. And, uh, wear that dress, will you? I had another drink at the bar and kept my eyes off her just enough to catch her looking at me with more than a professional look once or twice. She did go off guard right after I threw Malone's, Malone's name at her. I was sure of it. I finished my drink, waved to her, and went out the door like I had some place to go. But I stopped right after I got out of range of the windows, counted five, and eased back so I could just look in. She was leaving the platform, and I, along with the good, healthy fisherman, watched her take that white gown back to the phone booth. It wasn't taking her long to contact somebody about me contacting her. It was just chance so far, but there were Malone, Helen, and 218, a number of the murder room at the Crown Hotel. It still could have been coincidence, but there isn't much room on the back of a match folder. The Crown Hotel was a narrow brown stone front building squeezed between two more narrow brownstone front buildings. I looked in at the musty lobby. It was empty. I tried the door once to see if it was going to ring a bell someplace, and when nobody showed up, I went in. There was a dingy brown hunting scene hung on one wall and a dingy brown smell of bad ventilation hanging over everything. There was an immodest calendar from a Reno gambling club wasting its time behind the desk in a register book that had seen more lies than Munchausen. I flipped the pages back to the day before, found room 218. It was registered to one John Smith. And then uh, 
just on impulse, I flipped back to the current date and found myself on top of the whole mess. There, sprawled in an awkward hand against room 218, was the single name, Gallagher. Room 218 and the name Gallagher. All I needed to keep me going up those stairs. All I had to remember to enjoy bringing that 45 out of my shoulder holster was the picture of that wide grin and those gray eyes. I'd have gone through that door even if it hadn't been unlocked. Well, Skipper, go on in. I'm in, brother. What's all the hardware for, Skipper? Why are you always aching for a beef when you and I run into one another? Let's stow that warm friendship, shall we? Let's you do a little talking that you mean for a while. I never say anything I don't mean, Skipper. You'll learn that when you know me better. That's what I'm here for, Gallagher, so start saying something you mean. I thought you'd get here before this. What held you up? Something you mean, I said. That's right. I knew you'd be bullying around this neighborhood with your chin out. Why do you think I took this room if I wasn't waiting for you? What interests me most is that you're dead. Sure. I knew you'd like it, Skipper. I know you got to have somebody from Malone before you can clear San Francisco. You mean you're ready to confess? Not me, Skipper. I'm as clear as deep water. I got a witness. Do I know who he is? Not especially. I think you do, Skipper. He's the guy who killed Malone. They called him Mr. Fox. At about six last night, he was paying me 2,000 bucks to sign on the Scarlet Queen. Yeah, that's sure clearing you in my log. It'll clear me of murder. That's only a misdemeanor in this game. Now, starting from Fox, let's hear some more that you mean. I think you and I are going to team up and beat this thing by tomorrow. That's what I mean. You what? That's right. Starting from the Fox. He's working for Van Gord. If you didn't know that before, you know it now. Who's Van Gord? Yeah, you're being cagey, Skipper, and that's all right. You don't know what to say because you don't know how much I know. I don't know how much you know, so we're even. You're talking. The Fox didn't learn what he wanted to learn from Malone. He tried too hard. So he paid me two grand to sign on with you. I was supposed to go through your charts and tell him what part of the Southern Oceans you were making for him, find out everything about a Kang and son. The payoff was going to be a grand a month for just keeping the finger on you and waiting to be contacted. It was an easy deal. Somebody in your family must have been born with shark fins not too far back. <laughs> yeah, there was supposed to be a great uncle under the Jolly Roger skipper, but no fins yet. But I got reasons. I'm telling you this because if they'd pay off like that for just a line on you, I figure the real dough is going to be made on your side. I still want to ship with you, but for you. Well, I'm a... I'm telling you, Gallagher, for the price of the queen, I can't tell you who's crazy in this room. Nobody is, Skipper. You're going to be ahead, too, believe me, Art. Not ahead of you, Gallagher. I'm not crazy enough to turn my back on you. Listen to me. You know you're fighting a big outfit as well as I do. But I can clear up the mess here in Frisco. I'll put you next to the fox and his mermaid. Her name Helen? How'd you get that? She isn't hard to find. Well, that's right, Helen Curran. She led Malone to this room with a smile and a promise. Either one would look good from her. I know. I was there. Good. That makes it simple. Come on, I'm going to get you Malone's killers to prove whose deck I'm on. Or put me on a morgue slab for an extra two grand. I trust you like I trust a compass at the North Pole. All right, take a gamble, and it means your port clearance. But you got to have bait. That's you. And you got to have somebody who can put it in the right place. That's me. Come on, I'll show you how it works. It was about quarter of 11 when I pulled my left ear for luck the last time, followed him down to the lobby, and took my last look at that Reno calendar. Gallagher looked like he was enjoying putting me on the block. The only reason I could dream up for playing sucker was the idea that as long as I kept the line on him, I was at least secure to something. He squeezed me into the phone booth with him when he put the bait on the hook. He held the receiver so I could get my ear into it, too, and called Helen Curran at the Gorgonia. Hello, baby. This is Red. Well, it's about time. I thought you were coming in. Something came up. Did you get the gardenia? Yeah, I'm wearing it right now. When can I show you how much I like it? Don't talk like that when I'm so far away. Listen, I ran into something about the uh, Southern Oceans tonight. Oh? How good? Sounded pretty close to me. Did a guy come in there tonight looking for Dave Malone? Yeah, I told him I didn't know him. That was smart, baby. Because that guy was Pritchard. He's the one who beat me out of the berth on the Scarlet Queen. That sounds funny, Red. How'd you get all this? He stuck his head in the bar where I was, and I recognized him. He's got the information we want, baby. I could have maybe pumped him for it, but I thought it'd be better if you and the Fox were in on it, too. Maybe in your apartment later? That's for you to work out. Where is he? On his way back to the Gorgonia. 
I'd better tag along for the party, don't you think? Pritchard's big. Yeah, all right, Red. Give me a half hour to get through to the Fox and call me back. I'll let you know where he'll pick you up, okay? Yeah, but baby, take it easy till I get there. I don't want that gardenia crushed on anybody's shoulder but mine. <laughs> Helen Curran's apartment was in the Beulah Arms on Russian Hill. It was a little overdone and modernizing a setup that was dull mid-Victorian a few years back. Light walls with Venetian blinds and flamingos and parakeets flying through verdant jungles and framed before they started. And a bedroom to the right that she went into saying something about something comfy. When she came back, I saw clearly that she went for off-the-shoulder hostess gowns, too. Yeah. Yeah, now I feel more comfortable. Mm-hmm. What's the matter with me, anyway? Uh, is there something? <laughs> I always seem to stir the wrong approach in you, or are you just shy? With you, you don't need an approach. You just move naturally. <laughs> you aren't shy at all, are you? You're just overconfident. You've been spoiled by women. It never hurt me, but uh, then it's not very often as appealing as your brand. Do you think I'll spoil you? Uh-uh. But I wonder if you'd hurt me. Not even if I could, and I... <clears throat> hey, wait a minute. I couldn't hurt you if I wanted to, could I? I don't know. It gets so lonesome at sea. Like I said, uh, she knew her business, and I had to keep remembering that it wasn't all crushed gardenias tonight. We finally did get around to a drink out of a rattan-covered bottle, and I could tell by the heavy-lidded look she gave me over a glass that I was supposed to be a complete victim and as meek as a kitten with a full belly. She knew her business, but knowing that she knew her business, I went along with the kitten act, but I was as ready as a tomcat when the door opened. But I wasn't ready for who came through it. It was Funston. He was still looking through the rimless glasses, but now his eyes were steely hard and his mouth hung open a little like it was watering. It only took one deep breath to realize that he was the fox. Gallagher followed him in wearing the grin. Hey, boss, wait a minute. Something's wrong. This guy isn't Pritchard. Red, what do you mean? That's right. This guy's Phil Carney, the master of the Scarlet Queen. I was sitting on the couch, and after a sellout like that, there was no use standing up. Helen left me like I'd broken out with a purple pox, and Funston had a small caliber gun out of an inside pocket faster than I could get my breath. Gallagher still stood behind him, looking at me with that grin. Red, he's the one who was in to see me earlier. Never mind, Helen. Well, something went wrong, then. This isn't the guy I talked Never to. Never mind, I said. I'm well acquainted with him. You're an impulsive man, Mr. Carney. What are you doing here? I like a game of bridge as well as the next guy. You play a stupid game, Mr. Carney. You should remember that your Red Queen is not the top of the suit. She'll do. She'll never win a trick. You'll never use her. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean, but you're bluffing, Funston. Either that or you're double-crossing Van Gort and talking for yourself, fighting to stay clear of Malone's murder. I want more than talk. <coughs> yeah, you're still bluffing. You don't want to hurt me. Because with me out of the way, Van Gort's octopus would have nothing to follow. Wise up, Funston. You don't scare me. I'm too valuable. All right. I'll pay you $25,000 for the destination of your Scarlet Queen. I can't hear you. There are methods that talk louder than money. Now you're bluffing again. You never get it that way either. And what did Van Gort say if you laid me next to Malone? That's something I'll have to find out. At the moment, that looks better than arrest for murder. Stand up, Carney. You're really on a spot, Funston. You're even getting the double cross from your own people in this room. Uh, now who's bluffing, Carney? I mean, you're getting it from Gallagher. He knew who I was tonight. Gallagher. Skipper, why do you have to rush things? <laughs> oh, no. I'm all right, Skipper. I'll take him. Watch the mermaid. I raced her across the room to a table. She had a drawer open and a nickel-plated revolver half out of it by the time I grabbed it. <laughs> drop it, sister. Hey, drop it. <laughs> I said drop it. <laughs> Calm down, sister. Get over there and calm down. I grabbed her by the arm and tossed her across the room and had that 45 out before she landed. I twisted a look at Funston and Gallagher had hit him hard enough to keep him from opening until Christmas. He was tangled up with a throw rug and not thinking about a thing. Well, Skipper, there's your port clearance spread all over the room. Yeah. Now, what the devil was the idea of you leaving me to shake hands with that gun of Funston's for so long? I had to do it, Skipper. He knew I didn't have Pritchard up here, and I had to play along till we got ready to move. 
He knew? Yeah. He had some of his playmates guarding the Scarlet Queen. He knew Pritchard never came ashore tonight. Yeah. But we're a great team, Skipper. We're standing up and they're lying down. I'll agree with you there, Red. Keep them that way, will you? I got a proud call to make to homicide. Castle got what he wanted from Funston and Helen Curran. They didn't know any more about the whole story than I did. They were just stooges for Van Gort. What they couldn't answer made Kessel more curious than ever, and I told him what I could under legal pressure, which was just that Kang was sending me some place for something, where or what, I didn't know. After Pritchett heard about what we'd been through, he decided he'd like it better on a harbor tug. By two the next morning, Gallagher was signed on, and we cast off from Pier 12. We went through the Golden Gate under power, sitting on the wheel box with a bottle between us. We followed the channel buoys out to the Farallons, picking up that good deep water roll, and the Northwest trade started singing through the rigging. I felt like a man getting his back out of a cast and walking again. The crew perked up, too, and they fell to with a will when Gallagher started bawling orders. Stand by to make sail! The men liked them, too. Even the one he'd slugged had a pull from the bottle and shook hands with him. They took their stations at the mainsail. With port feet, make sail! And at the halyards, hoisted away smartly, and the peak of the mainsail climbed up the mast, and the white, strong expanse of it bellied out and pulled. I could feel it at the wheel. To the ship sheet, men! Smartly now! The jibsail boomed out, then the mizzen. The Scarlet Queen was glad to be free, too. She took the bone on her teeth and charged every swell as though she were carrying on a one-woman war with the whole Pacific. Is the rig heavy enough for you, Skipper? We're showing eight knots on the taffrail line. Ah, it's good enough. We'll hold her full and by until nightfall and then ease her off some. You got a fine lady here, Skipper. Ah, behaving like a queen. She's right for southern waters. She'd better be, mate. She'd better be. How long are we going to be down there? Well, we may never get there, so who cares how long it'll be? <laughs> not me. I'm not married. You are now, mate. To the Scarlet Queen, the bigamist. I'm going to get sick of sharing women with you. But let me take the wheel, will you? We got to have a honeymoon sometime. Sure, take over. Uh, course is 237 on the gyro compass. Got her? Got her. Hey, she's got spirit. You'll get us to Molokai Channel in less than 14 days. That means the Royal Hawaiian Bar in less than 14 nights. What a wife. What a honeymoon. Want a drink, Skipper? After you, mate. After you. Log entry. Catch Scarlet Queen, 5.30 p.m. Miles traveled, 31. Wind brisk, sea choppy with high cross swell. Mainsail and mizzen reef. Ship secure for night. Signed, Philip Carney, master. Sail into further adventure on the voyage of the Scarlet Queen next week at this same time. Port a call, Honolulu. The Voyage of the Scarlet Queen is written by Gil Dowd and Bob Tallman. Howard Duff plays Bill Carney, with Elliot Lewis as Red Gallagher. William Conrad was Inspector Kessel, Junius Matthews with Funston, and Helen was played by Kathy Lewis. Music scored and conducted by Richard Arant. The Scarlet Queen, directed by Jim Burton, is a command radio production.